Um, I'm going to go solar panels just really quickly uh, because we want to dive into that a little bit. I can't stress enough, especially if you're going offshore or even local, how phenomenal solar energy is. It has to be on everyone's radar. I'm not saying you're going to do it, but you should consider it. Especially if you leave the dock and you actually use your boat in a cruising application and you're trying to find a way to recharge your batteries. And batteries, like I said, are good up to a point. And I think battery banks in the past were bigger than they needed to be as a way to offset the rarity of how often we recharge our batteries. Because we would only recharge our batteries while underway or at the dock. And so some people use their boat only for weekend and then a battery's perfect because you leave the dock full, you come back empty, you plug in, you recharge, next weekend it's full again. But for owners that are leaving the dock for longer than a few days where the battery banks at this point, what do you do to recharge? Unless you have a genset and you can run your genset daily, how are you going to recharge those batteries? And are you going to run your engine under no load, i.e. you're not going A to B, but you're in an anchorage, running your engine under no load at 1400 RPM to recharge your batteries, even with a stock, even with a high output alternator, serpentine pulleys, the whole nine yards, you just went all out, did everything. That still is questionable to do that day in, day out to recharge your batteries. It's one thing if you do Vic Maui, three weeks, fine. But if you're offshore and you're gonna be there for an extended period of time, you're gonna run your engine every day at idle if you do that, it comes with a high cost in terms of engine maintenance later on. Not instant, but the bill is, someone's collecting. And you're not getting the bill right now. You're on a tab. So it's like, it's like anything, right? Everything's fine until someone has to pay. But one, someone's going to pay. So as owners, boat owners now, an option that we have is certainly looking at solar. And with the high efficiency panel, even at 18 or 22%, at the end of the day, poly or mono doesn't really matter. You can have a pretty substantial solar array to actually either do multiple things. Offset refrigeration, which is popular, right? A lot of people say, Jeff, can I offset my refrigeration? If I can do that, I'd be pretty happy. Jeff, uh, I'd like to stay at anchor a little bit longer, but for people that go offshore, it's, I need to meet daily demand because effectively, I don't plan on motoring and I need to be in an anchorage for two weeks and I'm not going to run my engine while I'm there for two weeks because people are not moving every day on a long term. They, they sit in an anchor. They might sit in an anchor for seven days because they're out for five years. They're not moving every day between anchorage and anchorage. They might sit in one place for a week. They might sit two weeks. They might sit for two days, three days. But again, when they're motoring, if they can sail, they're not going to motor because a lot of places, unlike British Columbia, you can actually sail to places. It's true, <laughs> right? I mean, it's amazing there. Like the trades are there every day. It's 15 to 20. You're silent. You're like, are we sailing? <laughs> yeah, we sail every day. They, a friend of ours, they left Martinique on their lagoon. They haven't fueled up since Martinique. Their tanks are like, they're like, I think I'm going to last another maybe year on the tanks. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, we run the engine only to recharge the batteries. I'm like, you've sailed all the way? Well, we leave an anchorage under power, but we keep sailing. Like, what do you mean you're sailing? <laughs> it's your form of propulsion? Like, you mean you do that just not for attack? No, it's trade winds. It's steady. I'm like, no, no, please repeat again. <laughs> like, I don't understand. So we are not, and this is why it maybe doesn't matter here because we're motoring all the time. But over there, you're actually sailing. And so now you're sailing and it drives people crazy because they're thinking, why would I be hearing the engine when I can sail at the same speed that I would under power. So now it start, the, now the sailboat thing starts making sense. So I'm like, oh, so that's why people have sailboats, <laughs> right? Like, oh, so you can go somewhere without fuel, no sound, but how do you recharge the batteries? And then that's where solar becomes really handy. So um, basically, there's different ways of doing it. These are flexible solar panels. Uh, this is what I did on my boat. I did that five years ago now. Small boat, it's 36 feet. Um, newer boats have wider and wider biminis now. P 
People that don't have arches, it's a good way to mount flexible solar panels. But regardless if you have an arch, because if you have solar panels, you need to find a way of how you're going to mount your, your panels, right? I mean, you're either going to do it on arch, you're going to do it on a rail, or you're going to do it on canvas. That's your three choices. Or your hardtop, if you have one. Some power boats, sailboats have really nice bimini hardtops now. So, okay, that would be another option, right? But it's canvas, hardtop, rail, or arch. Regardless of how you decide to fix them, the ratio, luckily there's a ratio, there's a short version of calculating what is watts to amp hours. Yes, there's long formulas and it involves a lot of assumptions, but in British Columbia, in this latitude, and it gets worse, so the ratios are not going to be as good down south because the days are shorter, in the summer obviously, not in the winter. You look at it, it's basically a factor of four. So if you have, for example, 400 watt array, you divide that by four, in British Columbia in the summer from May to September you're going to get about 100 amp hours a day. Down south it's about a factor of five to six. Yes, it's sunny down south, but the days are shorter. And as much as we complain about the rain in the winter and it feels like it never stops raining, our summers in Desolation Sound are phenomenal for the most part. And if anybody ever lived in eastern Canada, they would never complain about the weather again. Because the weather in British Columbia in the summer is just glorious. On the eastern seaboard, it can literally be cloudy for a month and rain nonstop. Rain nonstop in the summer here never happens. And certainly rain in the, in the trades, in the Caribbean, it's so sunny down there, you're going to get a really good output. I mean, you see the clouds, but the clouds just last for a moment and they just fly right over. There's nothing stopping them. So it's relatively sunny. So ratio of five to six down south, ratio of four here. So you can either divide by four if you go from watts to amp hours, or you can multiply amps. So let's say I, Jeff, I have a 200 amp hour budget. How many watts do I need down in the Caribbean? 200 times five equals 1,000 watts. So people on 1,000 watts is hard to do on a sailboat, but a catamaran pretty easy because they, they'll put them right behind where the, uh, the um, dinghy lift is and they'll just do a structure there and they'll just put four big panels and they'll do about a thousand watt. And a thousand watt is going to give them everything they need in perpetuity. And so their batteries are just simply to sustain the loads at night, which are minimal, and to give them a little bit of capacity if it gets cloudy. And so you generally size your array a little bit more than you need so you can make up for when you don't have enough when it's cloudy. Yes? Absolutely the same thing. Wow. Absolutely the same thing. The big difference is you pay price up front. Okay. That's the big difference. Huge difference. I mean, I have a client, for example, uh, we're doing a boat, Richard's solar panel, 270 watt is about $400. So pretty cheap. I mean, $400 probably Canadian. I think it's about 270 US. So that's probably 400 Canadian, I would think, about there. 400 Canadian for 270 watts. So that's pretty cheap. I mean, that's $1.35 a watt around, about that. A flexible, good quality, same quality, because if you buy Chinese, you can buy 350 a watt. If you buy good quality, like same like Kyocera, this is a top, top end brand on Rigid, top end would be Italian made, was about 550 a watt on the, on the most, the best value ones. It can go from there too, right? Obviously, 270 watt is a large array, 145 watt, you can go to 170 in flexible, but you can buy them in pono, mono and poly. And you don't always need to buy the mono, which are best, more efficiency, if you have a large amount of canvas. Some of the boats nowadays, even sailboats, have these massive biminis at the back of the boat. Huge! The transom doesn't get narrow like my boat. They've got like 14 feet wide beams at the transom, right? The boat, the beam carries all the way aft. The, the bimini is like eight feet long by 13 feet. Well, if you have that size, you don't need like 570 watt or 545 watt panels. You're already at 750 watts of solar array just on your bimini. So you can get with modern sailboats really big arrays, yes? Oh, absolutely, that's an absolutely valid concern. And that's why I said the bimini, not the dodger. But yes, yes, absolutely. 
on a bit, on a Dodger, no doubt, no doubt. If you've got the sun at, like up above, no problem, right? The sun is shining on both. But as the sun drops, and if you've got, and the sun, the shading from a boom on a panel is going to be massive. I mean, especially if you have a stack pack, forget about it. I mean, if it's in mass furling, fine. The boom is only this big. But if you've got a stack pack, it's like this big. The shading is forget diodes, no diodes. I mean, the panel's like literally obliterated. There's not going to be like, oh, I'm only shading a little bit of the panel. It's, you're basically half, one side of the Dodger is gone, is basically what it is. What you can do, if you're not swinging too much, you move the boom over with the traveler. You can do that. Um, but best thing is for sure to put them on the bimini. And it depends on what type of boat. Like, for example, a hunter, the boom goes way trap, right? They have, their, their main is huge compared to their, their Genoa, which, I mean, looks like almost like a jib, right? So their boom goes all the way back because of that arch that they have. So for them, their bimini is almost acting like a Dodger, right? The boom is going all, in part pretty deep. So it really depends on how your boat, the rig of your boat. Um, <laughs> but if you have partial shading, like, Oh, the radar is at this you know this height on a radar mast in the back and shading on the panel any good panel is going to have a diode now the word good and chinese don't go together unfortunately for solar panels they just don't you 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 do not buy something that is the lowest price and buy quality it's impossible i wish it was there you're just basically getting a panel that the only thing they're giving you is a low price and that's the trade-off. And that's fine if you know what you're getting. You're not getting a Kyocera panel at a fraction of the cost because Kyocera are just, you know, greedy. They're putting good quality stuff. The Chinese aren't, but they're meeting price point, And that's what they're shooting for. And that's what you get. So I think they're both price. Well, I would say the Chinese are probably the most expensive based on the quality. But they're both shooting for similar value. I think in the end, the Chinese is actually more expensive because you'll get changing it about every three years. Because the panels are, the protection of the panels, they yellow, the epoxy on the flexible yellows, and then you lose output. On the Italian made ones, either Gioco or Solbian, the, the material actually has a 20 year life. So it doesn't yellow at all. On my boat, I've had them for five years, never took them off. They give me the exact same output I had five years ago. Yes? You had mentioned briefly about lithium battery to run the AC. Uh, what are your general thoughts on using lithium batteries on boats? Um, I would say if you're a local cruiser in British Columbia, in light of the Firefly battery, I, think, I don't think there's really, it's not, it's for, I think now it's for less people. Fire, the good thing about lithium is it holds the voltage steady regardless of depth of discharge. It can take a very high charge rate, but the charge rate is hypothetical. Nothing can charge it fast enough anyways. I mean, it's three times capacity. Where are you going to find that? There's, it's a great number to think about. It's like saying my bank account can take any amount of deposits. There's no limit on my deposits. So it's great. I can deposit a million of dollars a day in it, and it's an amazing feature. But realistically, it doesn't matter. So three times of capacity when most of us are struggling to give 0.1 Point 0.2 of capacity in terms of a charge rate is irrelevant. Um, and it's often touted as one of the benefits. So fast charge rate on lithium is really not relevant for most of us because we don't have the chargers for it. And there's none available. You just simply can't find them. Not like recreational boats. I think what's interesting for lithium would be for people that go offshore and are staying offshore where the cycles, they're using their boat now and they're maybe going for five years. Now that's starting to be the life that you're going to get out of the lithium that has 2,000, 3,000 cycles, you're going to start seeing the benefit out of that because you're using your batteries every day. The other thing that's interesting is that the voltage stays steady regardless of the discharge rate. Like the, the, hold, the voltage holds pretty steady. Like it's not going to drop down, fluctuating all the time. It's going to really hold. It's going to go down, but it doesn't drop and go up. So for running big inductive loads like um, Aircon and stuff like that, I think that would be really useful. Safety-wise, uh, you Well, that's the other thing too. I mean, the reality is 
I mean, you always have to wonder, you know, that's the advantage with a lead acid battery is it doesn't have a computer on top. You can call it BMS what you want. It's a computer. It's not Windows, but it's a computer and it's making decisions. And it's actually pretty complicated. It's not like a couple wires. Um, people spend a lot of code making a BMS and making an optimized BMS for the lithium. And so I think they're figuring it out. But yeah, that's definitely a concern. And I think they're proving themselves. They're still an early adopter, I think. I don't think it's... Uh, in British Columbia, I mean, we deal with a pretty good segment of the population that have big budgets, I would say. And honestly, uh, I do maybe a lithium. I do it only in big boats. And we might do five lithium projects a year. And I work on 600 boats a year. And I probably do AGM is probably 80%. And then maybe another 20% is flooded. And lithium doesn't count. It's there, but it's such a small... I don't know. Now with Firefly, it's... Before Firefly, I would have thought... But with Firefly now... It's really a big contender because you have the depth of discharge. You know, you, you don't have 0.8 because with lithium you can go almost all the way to the top for charging. So you have 0.8 of usable. Firefly 0.65, but 0.65 on 0.8, it's not completely off, right? It's almost 80 over 100. It's pretty damn close in terms of capacity. So. And you need to have big boat budgets and everything needs to be changed. You don't put lithium on your boat without, like, everything. Like, the alternator has to be able to do it. Your chargers have to be able to do it. Like, like everything has to be, you just don't put it in. Like, it's a system. Yes? I thought you were saying that a lot of people in the Caribbean are going to lithium. Yeah, they are. Because, yeah, but they are. But, but they're using their boats differently, right? I mean, they're using their boats every day. They're, they're, they are, and... and that's the difference, is that they're using the cycles for us in British Columbia. Think about, think about this. A lead acid, flooded lead acid battery for an average person in British Columbia is going to last them about five to seven years at 300 cycles. And that's them mistreating the batteries and abusing them and everything, and they're being horrible to them. And I mean, it's horrible, right, what they do. They don't do anything good to the battery. That's the average person. If you get that amount of, that amount of life, from 300 cycles in British Columbia. What is the payback period for lithium in British Columbia? What does 2,000 cycles mean for you? 2,000 cycles? So it's gonna last six times longer than five years? What, what, what does 30 years mean to you in terms of life expectancy? Like, who makes decisions? I'm not even planning my retirement 30. I'm gonna buy a battery now and I'm gonna be like, Oh, I can't wait. My payback period is going to be over the next 30 years. What? In 30 years, the boats are maybe going to fly. Who, who knows what's going to happen, right? I'm kidding, but like really, are you going to make where the payback period is so slow? If you're cruising, you're using it every day. Then I think it starts making sense. Now you're putting 300 cycles a year, right? And so then you're doing five years, 1,500 cycles. And they're using their boats every day. In British Columbia, we're not. So I think the payback period for a local cruiser is harder to justify the spend. Might be other reasons. Might be energy density. Some people, some of my clients do it because they have no space. There's some boats that have no space for batteries and they want the capacity. That makes sense, right? There's some people that want to be able to say they have the latest and greatest. I have an owner right now I'm dealing with. He doesn't need it, but he wants it. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that makes him happy, and somehow when he says to the boat, I've got a lithium ion boat, or a lithium iron phosphate boat, and that makes him happy, well, so be it. I, I, I didn't start there, but that's what he wants. So I, I think it's really more, there's, an, there's a solution for the right boater. It's not for everyone. So these are images of flexible solar panels um, mounted on a, well, this looks like a Canran hardtop. You can see it's a window here, and you can see the wiring over there. You can actually peel and stick them now. This is a Solbian. Same panels I have on my boat. So how do you wire it? 
You know, do you wire them one panel, one controller, two panels to one controller, three panels to one controller? You know, what size controller do you put in? Uh, I personally think that for sailboaters where there's possibilities of shading, I would recommend that owners look at a dedicated controller per panel. Most people that come to this solution and want to have one controller for mo many panels come at it from a cost perspective on the belief, and this is a wrong belief, that this controller is the same price as this controller. So a controller that can do 600 watts of solar panels is not the same controller that can do 150 watts. And the price difference is not $10. It's not multiples of, but it's pretty damn close. So a panel that can do, a controller that can do two large panels is almost the price of two small controllers. So if you're doing it from a cost perspective and you think that you're saving money because a controller is a controller, you're going to seriously be disappointed because the price of that controller and that controller are multiples of that one. So then the question is, and this is a question, do you want to have your whole array be on one controller as a single point of failure? I certainly wouldn't because I depend on my solar array a lot in the summer because that's how I get all my power. So i rather have a controller per panel because first of all, the controllers are not that much more expensive. And yes, but I'm getting redundancy. And the other thing too is for shading because I do have also obviously some panels on the Dodger and when one of the panels is shaded, the other panel is not affected. So that's why I run them one panel per controller. But if you're not experienced shading, you can start definitely looking at series. And we've done boats, power boats that have no shading at all, where the canvas is higher than everything else, or the hardtop, and then we start putting the panels in series, within reason. But then the more you go in series, the higher the voltage gets, right? So then there's dangers too, right? You're gonna put four panels in series and have 80 volts, potentially, 90 volts. You, now you've got an owner dealing with what he thinks is benign 12 volts, and there's 90 volts coming on one end, takes those out, I mean, that would hurt. Now that's not gonna kill you, but that's really gonna be out, <laughs> right? So, I mean, there's a question too, is like, you know, how high the voltage? I generally go maybe on where there's no shading, I'll go maybe two panels in series. But most of the time, for our installations, we go dedicated controller per panel for redundancy and for and also for efficiency it's the most we're guaranteed that every panel is tailored to a controller so on my boat i have 6 panels 6 controllers the controllers are tiny like they're like my controllers are like this big these are mppt controllers they're like long like this high like this maybe this wide How, okay, well, it depends. On my boat, I went through two different ways. On the, off my Bimini, it goes into a gland that I mounted on my radar mast, because I have a pole-mounted radar mast, and it looks like magic, where I have a sandwich. What I do on most boats for flexible is I actually have a new canvas built on top of the existing canvas, and so, all the wiring from the solar panels go in between the two. So you have no cabling above, no cabling underneath, but I'm aesthetically driven, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an affliction. It's, it's expensive, but it makes things, I mean, I have to make it pretty. So it goes in between the two sandwiches, and then there's no wire. You don't see wires from above. You don't see wires from below. You don't see seams, because there's no stitching. There's no water permeability, right? Because all the zippers are mounted on the top canvas. And then all those wires aggregate, and then they'll go down, either through a radar post, or they'll come down on one of the sides, and I run them through this, like, tech sleeve that lets water through, but you can't see the cabling, so you can't see that there's wires there. You don't know what it is. And then I'll come in through a deck land on the side. And that's how I do it.
and when I say I, I mean, like we've done about 300 uh, solar panels install. We did 75 last year, and that's generally the formula. I mean, the first year we did one, it was my boat, but it's growing at a rate of about 100% right now in terms of install base every year. Because it really works. I mean, that's the reality. Like on my boat, I don't run my engine. I don't know if you realize, if there's sailors in the room, the concept, it's mind-blowing, of leaving an anchorage with your batteries full, <laughs> arriving to an anchorage under sail with your batteries full, and having running loads while you're sailing, staying in an anchorage for seven days, and leaving and having the batteries full. And that lasts for five months from May to September, where I don't even plug in and my fridge is always on, and we have more power than we can ever use. That's a miracle, really, when you think about it. And that's why solar is such a big deal, because you can actually be in a state where you don't think about water, not water, but power anymore. The only thing you think about is water. Where am I going to get my water? And if you have a water maker, it's solved. And then after that, it's what am I going to do with my garbage? And after that, well, then you're done. It's, it's your, you can be out there forever, really. It's, it's water, power, and garbage. And so power is, for me, and for most of us, is the limiting factor. And that's why solar is really good. Tow generators are another way. Um, this is a, there's a model there. Some of us are certainly doing that, but that's more for people that are definitely going offshore. Here's another model. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, right, and it comes down. That's right. I actually, you know, I was pleasantly surprised uh, how quiet a lot of those wind generators down were in, uh, in the Caribbean. The one thing that the Caribbean has and a lot of those places have, unlike British Columbia, I think a wind generator here is crazy. The anchorage, first of all, in my opinion, our anchorages here are hurricane bomb-proof holes like that are made for Category 5 landfalls at any given moment all the time. You sail in the Caribbean and you realize it'd be like sailing in Georgia Strait and dropping a hook on like Sandhead and saying, because you're behind a boy, it's going to be pretty good overnight. <laughs> like, people in the Caribbean have no idea, and I don't think a lot of them are for British Columbia, because if they are, they're probably like, this is not what I signed up for. Our anchorages are so calm, so smooth, and the trees are so huge, there's practically no wind in our anchorages. You see them most of the time. It takes a lot of wind before it picks up. And because the trees are so high, and we're, the anchorages are so tight, the wind generators here don't amount to much. You don't see them ever really turning until they turn too much, and it's really blowing. But in the Caribbean, because there's no real trees, I mean, the trees are super low, you're far from shore because it's so shallow, right? You can't go to shore like here. You've got to be offshore. Um, and you're always swinging. You're not stern tied. You're swinging right into the wind. A lot of owners have wind generators, and they're actually not that, they're pretty quiet. The new ones, and I would, cons I would strongly suggest anybody going offshore to think about a wind generator. Because it's a way to offset what your solar does. I don't think it's one or the other. You probably would do both. Yes? Short track of Rutland's wind generator from Rutland in New England. And specifically researched it for noise level and also for very low initial um, uh, output. output. Yeah, for wind. And how is it? Yeah, honestly, I was pleasantly surprised. I've, I've heard some in British Columbia where I had visions of me being a Navy SEAL and doing a special operation <laughs> and reducing the noise in the anchorage. And I've actually thought about, like, what would I do if I could kind of thing? Uh, because the noise was absolutely insane. I remember when I went around Vancouver Island, there was one. It was, we had to leave. I mean, it was, it was, it was, like, it was like a generator running in the bay. Yeah. But nowadays, some of them are extremely quiet. I think it's worth considering. Absolutely.
I'm going to quickly talk about this um, and then we'll go to the question. We'll take a five minute break and then I'm going to do a bunch of slides, just recaps. Another thing you can consider if you're local, and this is definitely not for offshore because the fuel is hard to get, but if you don't have a generator on your boat and you're looking at a way to increase your charging capacity without a generator, and only recharge the batteries. Remember, this is not an AC generator that creates AC, so you can't run any AC appliances. Would be a methanol fuel cell. Certainly not, I don't think, for someone that's going to be using their boat day in, day out, 365 days a year. But for boaters that are using their boats here locally for you know, three weeks, a month, six weeks, two months, I have a lot of owners that have gone to Alaska with it, are doing the Browns, are doing Vancouver Island, doing Vic Maui's. People that have a short window duration it's basically a battery charger, effectively, that runs off methanol. And it doesn't output a lot of current, but it does so, because it's so quiet, it's only 22 decibels, um, it makes no noise, really, no smoke, no vibration, practically. You can't feel it. So that it's running in the background is not a nuisance, and so you can have it run 24 hours a day. And they'll give you about 210 amp hours a day, 145 amp hours a day or 80 amp hours a day, depending on the model. And so it is a solution for some of us that have limited battery banks and don't want solar, depending maybe because some people that go to Alaska, you know, you're not always going to see the sun when you leave desolation. I mean, I've had some clients that never saw the sun for two months, right? I mean, that's it. They went in discovery and some years you don't see the sun. Some other years you see it, but some years you don't. So that would be a one way to offset the risk of solar would be having a methanol fuel cell. And uh, what I will do is take just a couple minutes, maybe two, three minutes stretch, and then because we're going to finish at 4.30, but I want to do some questions. The answer is, for, don't say it out loud. So the question is, what is the standard unit of measure for electrical current? So we talked about that a little bit. We talked about current is effectively like speed. Anybody want to air a guess? Amps. Amps, that's right. So again, don't blur about the answer. Think it, just read the question. We're talking about good conductors and good insulators. On a boat, because let's talk about things that are relevant for a boat, what is a really good conductor on a boat? Anybody want to take a chance, chance at that? Copper. Copper, that's good. What would be a good insulator on a boat? Plastic, Plastic. yeah. We're not going to see glass on a boat. We're not going to see ceramics. I mean, those happens out here on the grid, on land, but on a, boat, on, on, on a boat, we don't see that. So we talked at length about this. What are the two main characteristics and of choosing a wire for a boat? And I went at length about the differences between land-based systems in Europe and North America versus boats. So first of all, what's the criteria that's most commonly used and really the only one that kind of matters on land here? What's, there's two things. What's the one that people always think is the one that only matters. Do you guys? Amps. Amps. You look at the table and they look at the amp draw, right? What's the amp capacity for the size of the wire, right? Right? But what did I say earlier too? I said, but most households electricians, because on land they only look at amps, what's the one thing they don't or they forget to look at when they're sizing a wire on a boat? Voltage, uh, drop. voltage drop. That's right. So make sure that when you're hiring someone that's a so-called expert and they're sizing a wire, question. Don't assume. How many windlasses I can tell you that I've seen wired with 4-gauge wire? It's unbelievable. 4-gauge. It's crazy. And that labor to run that wire is days. Could be three days to get to the bow of a boat. If you make a wrong error and you have to rerun, it's three more days of work. Right? And extreme, on top of the 4-gauge, it's completely useless. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's like 40 foot, easy 30 to 40 foot there and back. And so the person who put it in, land-based electrician, right? I got this. It's easy. When you're doing that calculation, though, you have to, even if you know you've got 40 feet of table, the voltage drop, your, the, the calculation is based on 80. 80. That's right. 80 feet. 80 feet. It's crazy. And then, and then again, my windlass doesn't work. It's unreliable, or it keeps burning, or it doesn't have juice, or I can't lift up the anchor if it's more than 30 feet of water. And how often does that happen in British Columbia? 
right? 30 feet of water, it's pretty shallow. 30 feet of water in the Caribbean, it's like five feet, we're good. Like, you know, I four and a half feet, it's pretty deep. <laughs> I mean, it's like you're dropping the anchor, like, are we sure we're okay? Oh, it's really deep here, it's 10 feet. I'm like, 10 feet? I see people jumping off the boat, I'm like, it's practically not even a swimming pool, right? So um, you definitely want to make sure that if you've got a windlass and you're going to be using it in British Columbia where there's a big depth of water column and it's 50 feet, 40 feet, or in Desolation Sound, 60, 70 feet, depending on the anchorages, that's a lot of weight, a pound per foot, plus whatever, you're going to have 100 and whatever you're holding up if there's any dirt while you're lifting, right? So you want to make sure that you've got a really good gauge wire. We said also, unrelated to this question about voltage, what do we say? We said it's really important to run your engine while you're running your windlass, okay? Because you're going to increase the voltage, so you're going to offset the voltage drop. So that's a little bit more technical. What's a short circuit and why is a short circuit considered to be dangerous? Someone that hasn't given, uh, hasn't answered. Anybody want to air a chance on that one? So first thing is, well let's talk about, yeah let's talk, what is a short circuit? No resistance. Yeah, that's good, that's a really good example. That's a really good, no resistance. Meaning that suddenly there's no loads. Right, because a load has a resistance. So a wire connecting two battery terminals, would that be a short circuit? A wire directly connecting two battery terminals? Yes. Or two wires that suddenly have something that shorts them together, right? Like we were showing in the video a bolt, or it could be someone putting a screw in or something like that, when they're mounting something on a mass, I've seen that happen. Um, fellow was installing an aft nav light or aft deck light, drilling through stainless steel, right? The drill as he went through shorted, right? Shorted it, melted the bundle all the way down to the engine panel, to the panel on the bridge. So why is it dangerous? Because what's the most important thing? What happens when you have a short circuit? heat unlimited current, right? And so what's going to happen is the, effectively the wire is going to become almost a fuse if there is no fuse on the circuit, right? And that's really important. Remember, if every circuit on a boat was wired like a house, boats wouldn't catch on fire as much as they do. That's the reality. And that's why there's a code on LAT. The code is there to protect everything in the sense of Everything has a breaker on land. It's criminal not to. It's not an option. You can't say, oh, I don't feel like one. I don't think it's important. You have to have a breaker for every circuit in a home, on a boat, because people have a choice, right? That's ultimately, it's a recommendation. They don't have to do it. That's the reason that you need to be even more careful about short circuits, because there's no safety. There's no backup. In case there is a short, you might find yourselves with having a fire because of so much current, there's going to be no protection on that line, unfortunately, okay? Because if there was protection, most of the time, as we see, there's exceptions. The fuse shorted close, which is crazy. The fuse should open, and then there should be no problem. Okay, so what about this one? If we increase the resistance in an electrical circuit, what happens to the current flow? So that would be the formula V equals IR, right? Voltage equals current times resistance. Yeah, so if, if voltage V equals IR, then if you've got an increase in resistance, then you're going to have a decrease in current. On a boat, what might cause an increase in a resistance in a circuit? We talked about that. And that's why I think, remember what I was saying earlier, I said, you're never going to think, you know, nobody's ever going to tell you resistance ohms. They're not going to say a by water pump is this ohms or this is this ohms. Nobody's ever going to tell you ohms anything on a boat, ever. But why are we talking about resistance? Why does resistance matter? Because you can unintentionally or unintentionally have resistance because of bad connections, bad crimps, corrosion, right? And that's why we bring it in as a subject matter. It's for you to avoid that. Take the time to do things properly to avoid corrosion, so that you avoid resistance. 
All right, so this circuit here, we talked about if this is a parallel or a series. Parallel. Did, yeah, parallel. Uh, now, do we, if it was in series, it would be light, 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 and then return. But because you see how it is, you actually see that in a lot of sailboats or powerboats. You'll see wires, lights, they'll come into a little junction and they'll fan out and they're a daisy chain. And that is effectively like a daisy, right? And that's where that term comes from, daisy chain. In, out, in, out, in, out. All right. What is the total voltage of that battery bank? So it's unusual, it's three and three, but what's the total voltage of that battery bank? Six volts, that's right. Here's another really important formula. That's the one that realistically you're gonna use a lot more than V equals IR. Power is equal to voltage times current. That's the most important one because you use that a lot to size because you're going to get a lot, all your appliances are going to be often rated in power. Not all the time, but a lot of them are going to be rated in power. A windless, 1200 watts, 700 watts, right? It's pretty common. Wind, uh, inverter, 2000 watts, 600 watts. They're giving you a power rating and if you want to calculate how much current it's going to draw, you would go, for example, now we do 1200 watts divided by power, what is that going to give us, first of all, as a unit of measure, just the math between those two? And amps, that's right. Yeah. Right? That's right. I, I, that would be a heat, that's, that's like a hair dryer or a microwave on an AC circuit is going to draw 10 amps AC. Assuming the inverter does the conversion efficiently, which there's no such thing, it would be 1200 divided by 12 equals 100 amps, but 100 amps DC at 12 volts. So for a uh, latch chain wire, for say your bigger appliance to draw two amps, what formula would you use for that little wire? You would use two tables, voltage drop and ampacity tables, or use an, uh, an app that you can download and you enter all those values in, you're gonna have to, there's gonna be like seven, eight, I don't know, variables. Like I said, engine room, not engine room, the insulation of the wire, is it in a bundle, not a bundle, is it 3% voltage drop, 10% voltage drop, is it a 12 volt system, 24 or 36 volt system, is it an intermittent load or fixed load? <laughs> like, it's crazy, right? But that's what it is, I mean, you know, you, it's like golf, you don't play golf if you don't try. Like, nobody goes and says, I'm never gonna look at the ball, I'm not gonna care, and I'm just gonna have fun. You, if you want to do electrical, these are things you have to care about. And it's kind of fulfilling to care about things that are complicated because then you get satisfaction. Like when you play golf well, you can brag about it because it is hard. Electricity is the same thing. It's not easy. If it was easy, it's not worth... I feel in life that nothing's worth doing if it's too easy anyways. So go through the app. Blue Seas has one. It's amazing. And instead of having tables. So... We talked, and I'm just going to summarize here. We've, we're asking, what's the difference between alternating current and direct current? What do you feel, anybody feel a guess what's the difference? How would you describe it? I mean, other than alternating direct. There's, I need a little bit more than that. Yeah, well, actually, you can, actually, voltage is irrelevant of that. Yeah, voltage is not, pardon? Can be, yeah. It's between, it never changes polarity, right? So with alternating current, one thing you have to ask yourself is the frequency at which it alternates, right? Is it 50 hertz or 60 hertz? Which is gonna matter a lot depending on your appliances. Are they built for Europe or here, right? Because you could have a 120, 60 hertz and a 220, 50 hertz, right? And it's the rate. And also when you think about, we didn't talk about that, but sinusoidal is what AC waveform looks like. Right? It's a sinusoidal wave. Like the moons, the tides are all sinusoidal. The seasons are sinusoidal. Everything changes gradually. There are inverters that are modified sine wave that have square waves, and they go you know, from one state to the other suddenly, um, and those cause a lot of problems with what are called inductive loads. Inductive, pardon? Yeah, NAC can kill you. 
I mean, that's a big takeaway. I try to say that, right? I mean, I don't mind people per playing around with 12 and you know saying they're dangerous and stuff like that. But with 120, when your life is at stake, you need to research, read, take a lot of precautions, and don't take it lightly. Yeah, oh my God. You have no idea. There's people that actually intermittently have used, and I've seen this, where they're going to actually be using, because when you look at AC, you're thinking about three colors, right? In North America, black, white, and green. When you think about DC, you're thinking about red and yellow. In the past, it used to be black, but for good reason, they changed it. Because black in DC is benign, ground, and black in AC is death. So you had one color that meant the absolute opposite things. So color coding is absolutely essential, and it's really essential that even though all of that means the same thing to you and you've got an amazing memory and you have context, never, ever, ever underestimate how complicated or confusing it's going to be to someone else that might come after you and looks at a wire and if it's black, it's going to think it's one or if it's red. So on one boat we saw red being used for AC hot. So 12 volts DC is not dangerous, but 120 AC hot is extremely dangerous. AC. Yeah, so it's, it's called um, the, the hot, unit? the hot, the neutral, and the, and the grounding. Yeah. Well, there's no positive on AC. It's, it's hot, neutral, and ground. Or hot, ungrounded, grounding. Is positive, and DC is negative. But if you're wiring a boat from, and you're doing things on a boat, strongly suggest that you abandon black for the DC negative and go with yellow. Because it's safer. Because you don't have to have context. Generally people will be able to tell, they'll be like, oh, that's a big wire, it must be 12 volts. But the problem is on some boats, the gensets are outputting now, they've got gauge six. Right? Gauge six wire is starting to be, is that 12 volts? Or is that 120? And now you start to have to think about context. What other wires are you seeing beside it? And with, without context, you might do an error that might be really grave. And so I think, why, why have context? There should be no context. It should be color, should be the only thing. You see black, it's you know, hot. You see yellow, it's DC ground, right? Negative. OK, when a flood and lead acid battery is discharged by 50%, what's its approximate voltage if it's been left charged, not charged or discharged for 24 hours? Because remember, that's a caveat here, right? 12.1. 12.1, 1. 12.2. 12 it was on the table. 38. Hey? 38. 38 what? Percent. So it's 50% if it charges one day at 12%? No, it's the, if you're seeing the, if you're seeing the voltage, 50%, I'll go back to the table later on. 50%, the voltage at 50%, if it hasn't been charged or discharged, is going to be 12.1, 12.2. Okay. Longer look question. So we got a, a flooded lead acid battery. We got its deep cycle because they're talking about amp hours. The bank is fully charged. How many amp hours are available before we should recharge? So the question is what's the depth, the maximum depth of discharge a flooded lead acid battery should have? And how many amp hours is that? 200, that's right, because it's 50% of 400, which is 200. What's the purpose of an alternator? What does an alternator do? Charge the battery. And that's a good point, because remember, an alternator, and I get this all the time, alternators have nothing to do with generators, have nothing to do with shore power. They are strictly have to do while the engine is running. And the engine has to run. Okay, I know it sounds obvious to some of you, but it's really essential, right? The, un the engine has to be turning for the alternator to function, okay? Doesn't mean you have to be underway. Underway is better for the engine, but you can rev up an alternator at idle, unloaded, and even rev up. It's just not good to do that on the engine. 
So DC power, yeah. Oh, we can cover that. In a boat's DC circuit, um, and it's wired to AC, let's talk about the first one. What does this one, number one, what does it do? A, positive, positive. It could be 12, 24, it could be 32, it doesn't matter, it's positive, direct current. Now this one here, we talked about in the past, what were people using that wire for, for DC current? Negative, Negative yeah, Negative. or ground. And, and it's confusing, a ground, a DC negative is only ground when the negative is grounded. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Meaning, you can have, if you have a battery, for example, if you have a battery, and I see this all the time, and this is a big problem, you have a battery, and the battery, like for example, that inverter example that I was talking to you about, where the grounding on the AC inverter charger was running 12 amps, you have a battery, a negative and a positive, and you connect it to anything. You connect it to, let's say, a windlass, for example. That's a good example because some people install windlasses on boats and have a dedicated battery up front. Okay, they do that because the battery's too far. But then there's issues with how do you get that battery recharged and how do you get it recharged when the alternator's running and how do you get it recharged from a charger. And there's implications, but sometimes you have to put one up. A battery that's installed in a Ford locker, running a windlass, is that battery grounded? Is there a DC ground on that battery? No, there's not. There isn't. Nope, there isn't. There's a DC negative, but there's no ground. So a DC negative can only be ground if it's actually grounded. And the only way it's grounded is it needs to have some sort of connection back to the water, because our water is a ground. And how we ground things on a boat is we connect them to an engine, and the engine is connected to the transmission, which is connected to the shaft, which is going outside, assuming there's no flexible coupler on the transmission. Well, yeah, but it's more, the alternator generally is actually, that's where it gets complicated. It's not so much the alternator, it's through the starter. Because the alternator most of the time is actually gonna be connected, daisy chains to the starter, and most alternators don't have a negative. The negative is going through the engine block out the negative cable that is also now the grounding cable back to the battery. Okay, So it's a DC negative, potentially also a DC ground. Right? What about this one? Uh, pardon? Oh, then, you're, then you've got some serious problems and we need, you need to look into that because you cannot have an ungrounded boat. You need to have a brush or something. You need to have a connection that brings it back to ground. You cannot have a floating ground. Floating ground means a ground that is not tied to ground. It's just a negative. You can't have that. What about here? What's the yellow mean on DC? Negative. negative. And that's the way to go for it. So if you're buying colors for your boat, for wiring, please, please, please. Don't buy red and use yellow heat shrink. Don't, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Please, don't do it. You, you, you know how much it, 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 people like me, we go on board, it causes us, like we have palpitations. It's just not good, okay? You, you, red for red, yellow for yellow. Like you, don't, don't buy yellow for the red, because most people, what they're thinking is like, why would I buy two spools of wire when can I buy one spool of wire, right? That's the, it's money is what drives this decision. The problem is, what's going to happen is, your understanding of your electrical system now and in 15 years from now, or another owner, might not be the same. And you might know everything about your electrical system today, but one day you're going to be down on that battery, and it's, you're going to be tired, and something's going to have to happen really quickly, and you might make a really bad decision because you're going to see a red wire on a, on a negative, and when it's time to reconnect, you're not going to clue in that there's a little heat shrink that's yellow that's now tarnished and really faded and you're going to put it on the wrong post and you're going to cause a dead short and if you do a dead short with the battery cable the battery's going to explode in your face like literally it's done like it's finished like it's going to be an explosion so battery acid is bad so use the right color for the right application oh, forget the black altogether. yeah forget the black altogether only use black 
on small, effectively AC wiring, right? And AC wiring for most of us is 10.3, maybe 8.3 if you have a generator. Maybe on your boat you have a 6.3, maybe. I don't know how big your generator is. But generally, if it's a 5KW, it's going to be maybe 8.3. If it's bigger, I mean, on some boats we see number two. But again, AC, yes, you're fine with black. But DC, leave it. Just go yellow. Safety. Okay, so which one? We talked about craziness, metric versus imperial. Which one has the largest gauge wire? 10. Ten. Yeah. It's complicated because it has to be. Uh, what are the two main criteria needed to select the courage gauge wires used in a boat's electrical system? It's a little bit of a redundancy, but what do you guys think? Yeah. Voltage drop and ampacity. <laughs> or current, yeah. <coughs> And there's more factors than that because in the table I tell you, is it going in an engine room? Is it part of a bundle? Is it an intermittent load? Is it a fixed load? Is it a 3% voltage drop? Is it a 10% voltage drop? So this is kind of like, you're going to be looking at two tables and each of those tables are going to have multiple sub-selections within them. So you mentioned the voltage drop on those tables. What types of um, applications can you allow for the 10% voltage yeah, there's a norm. Uh, I think Nigel talks about things that are acceptable. Like, for example, nav lights, 3%. Um, most things are 3%, to be honest. Electronics, 3%. Because they're very low current, so it really doesn't matter. Things that are acceptable, I think, for 10, I think is a winless, right? Um, doesn't mean that that's the lowest bar, that that's the bar you want to shoot for. Like, for example, when I do solar, I go for less than 3 I want to harness everything the solar can give me. I want to squeeze all that juice out of my panels. Some people are like, ah, oh, if I only get, you know, I lose 10% worth so the big deal. Well, then you didn't buy a 100 watt panel, you bought a 90 watt panel, yeah. right? I'm not going to have that. So you've got a table and there's a table, honestly, in Nigel's book and it'll list everything. Uh, I try to do maybe a windless and probably an inverter is another one. And because it's just simply too big, you can't do 3% are probably the ones where you do 10%, and most everything else is 3% voltage drop. You'll see it's shocking. When you put those numbers in and you look at the cabling on your boat, you'll be like, what the hell? And, you'll, and this is the most, that was the most unnerving thing for me as a bone earner, was the realization that my boat was not perfect when I bought it. Because I assume when I buy a car, I bought a Toyota, it's a Toyota. Like, I didn't buy an FJ Cruiser and think, oh, my FJ's been completely modified. The factory did it one way, but the last previous four owners did it all their own way, and now I've got to get it the right way if I want it back to Toyota way. Like, I, I buy a car, I buy a car, and it was used, and I assume it's still a car, and it still is, and nothing's changed. On a boat, though, the, the, the sad reality is that boat owners make decisions based on what they have for risk profiles and how they value money and risk. And what they don't realize is, a lot of them, is that those decisions are decisions that a lot of people would not be comfortable with if they knew what the risk was, right? And so family members, guests, are coming on board a boat believing that this is kind of a standard, right? If I, I would never go in MacGyver's house if he invited me for a sleepover. <laughs> I just wouldn't, right? I'd be like, are you crazy? Like, your house is probably jerry-rigged. I, I don't, I'm not going to do that. I'm not comfortable. Actually, I'm going to stay on the road. Like, that's a safe and not too safe distance. And a boat is like that. And that's what's so scary as a boat owner. Never assume that, especially, unless you have a new boat, brand new boat, always question everything that's been done on your boat because the previous owner, most of the time, is going to make decisions strictly based on budget. And budget alone and risk, because they don't understand it, is simply thrown out. And so all those boats that are out there have crazy, crazy electrical. Because people are making decisions strictly based on budget without understanding the implications. And so it's very important when you do work on your boat or question everything. <coughs>